Welcome to Bookie's Place. How are you guys doing? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know what we do here. We don't talk about the glitz or the glam. We talk about the grit and the grind. And we'll bring your favorite people to share their experiences, things that they've never said anywhere before. You know, so today is going to be phenomenal because I have the very, very cutting edge TV host. He gets to host people, but today, guess what? He's on the other side of the fence. So my guest today is Daryl Edu. Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll for the one and only Daryl Edu. Yeah. <laughs> Bookie, first and foremost, happy new year, happy Christmas, happy Valentine, happy Bookie's place, happy interview, happy Instagram live, happy Twitter, happy high five, but don't you go, 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 everybody, when they tune in, I say live and direct, Bookie, Maurice, you are the commodore of the Republic and your ministry can never run down. <laughs> Darling, talk of making an entrance. <laughs> oh my I'm god, sorry, I joined it. My apologies, everyone. I was it's in okay. the middle of so much going on, and I just managed to find a very quiet corner, shop, shop, because there's a party going on where I am. You understand in the surroundings, so <laughs> we shall be there. Anthony, more than you. It's all good, man. Welcome, welcome, Daryl. You and I have been working since the 60s, man. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> we come a long way. Thank you so much for having me on Bookie's Place. And ladies and gentlemen, to everyone tuning in from Twitter, from Instagram, from High Five, but don't you go by space. Can I just say that B-O-U-Q-U-I is one entertainer that changed the narrative, rewrote history, and gave us music like never before. My darling, I just want to give you kudos. Thank because you. I appreciate it. They said that the greatest form of activism is to, you know, be a living example of the kind of people that you like to walk this earth with. You were a light in the darkness. And you also, you were an advocate for walking in your truth and also for people that did not find it safe to walk in theirs. You changed the narrative. Try it, mama. Try oh. <laughs> it. Appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Toby says she was a makeup artist. Yes. I remember dragging Toby to the Sound City Music Channel back in those days. Mm -hmm. This is when before Toby met Stenchu. Toby, I'm a two go Shiri and then I'm a two go And then you know Toby was one of the MBGN queens. Meanwhile, um, Bookie, sorry to digress for a minute. We had a special surprise dinner for Erica. Erica was one of the most, well, she's currently the most talked about housemates, if not one of them, from the just concluded um, Big Brother season five, you know, lockdown. And Toby, we had a dinner with all the NBGN girls. Toby, you should have been around. Because you're an NBGN. Uh -uh. I carry TT. Toby knows what Toby, I'm talking about. Toby is a Yankee now. Let me tell you, let me tell you a small story. Please. It's, it's short oh, and it's complicated. My mom's mom, my grandmother, yes. Toby's mom's mom, her grandmother, yes. they are sisters, blood sisters. Ironic. That means people are like um, second, cousins. Cousins. second yes, cousins. Second cousins. What? <laughs> Yes. 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 Listen, we love the flavor you bring. I know you're trying to bring all your stories together and all that, but I want you to what we do here is we give people practical tools. When life yeah. is hard. Life is hard. Mm -hmm. You're, you know, you find yourself in a position 
And yes, there are less and just be authentic, be yourself. How do you get there? You know, when you're in a crisis, the last thing you're going to be doing is opening book. And hey, chapter four, it says that yeah. put your test out, put your next. Mm -mm. You just want to remember someone's story. So you've told us your story. Oh, wow. This is perfect. The network is so good now. I can see you clearly. <laughs> don't shout. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. It's what you are saying that is making it so brave. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. No, but um, we've heard your story. I want you to tell us the time that you knew you were different. Okay. Ha, that's a very good one. That's a million dollar question rolled into one. I knew I was different. right? And I'm not going to say right from birth. I'm not going to say right from primary school. Because even right in primary school, I just kind of felt isolated from everyone else. Everybody was my friend. Again, I'm one of those people. I have too many friends, too many acquaintances. Everybody knows me. But then I just knew that I was just alone from the pack and I was different from the guy next door. You know, and truth be told, it was the reception that came with feeling different. The receptiveness, and I'm going to say negative reception at that, that made me knew that I was totally different from everybody else. And people did not quite understand it. They couldn't come to terms with it. They did not even want to see the creativity around it. They just did not want to like it or welcome it at all. So there were times when I would go to church because, you know, I was in the choir in church. I mean, my dad was like the male wording. So we all had to join the choir, myself and my sisters. And I remember times when they would walk me out. I was even excommunicated from the church. And this is at a very young age. Old. I was still in secondary school. I was excommunicated from the church because I looked a certain kind of way, alien to what the average quintessential Nigerian oh, no. male child would look like. Also, you know, if I want to take public transport and whatnot, I had drivers and conductors throwing me out of the bus. I remember times that I would take buses and then passengers would enter and shout, ah, we're in the day, you know, and everyone. So I said, you know what? Enough of the public transports. I have strong legs. Make a the waka this waka. But then guess what? Walking was even worse. I remember days that I would go for auditions on the mainland and I would have to trek to our house in Yaba. And guess what? Lagos is synonymous with traffic. And Nigerians, we get bored easy. Once you are in traffic, you are looking for what to do. If you have this in your car, look around. Anything you see that is alien to the Nigerian narrative, you throw stones at it. I mean, Buki, honestly, people will forever throw shade where the sun shines. Yo, Punchline, punchline, so, punchline, punchline. I mean, you know, walking my own journey. You just see people, they wind down. Stupid boy, that is grace. Why you dress this way? And then people would buy pure water and start stoning me. They would buy like garden egg. I remember they would stone me with garden egg and all those. Are you hear me? Another, another Sorry, call another came call in. To to so let me, you, let me tell you, let me tell you. Wait, I can't wait. hear you. Oh. Yes. The audio has disappeared. That's Colla from France. That's Colla <laughs> from France. Hold on, bring my chest away from you. Not you, the Colla that is calling. Go to the Baojo, you check. Oh. Anyway, still talking about wait, how I knew I was wait, different. Wait, wait, wait. So you can't when hear I me. I walk on the street Ooh. in Lagos and people could not understand the direction, not necessarily where I was headed, but the direction of why I looked the way I looked and why I embodied something totally alien. To what they used to, so people will stone me even in, on campus. Oh, that is the only part of people that used to have me say. I remember, like Marere Hall, which was quite close to um, the campus shuttle area, the bus stop. We take buses, and then on more students will come out in that hostel. They start stoning me, and it's very easy to throw things from Marere to the campus shuttle area. They call me all kinds of names. People would, because of my effeminate nature, they'll dwell on that. Because of the way I looked, they'll say that, oh, I was cuckoo in the head and needed, like, Yaba left immediate attention. And then all sorts, all kinds. Lecturers woke me out of class every day. Ugh. So, you see, everybody's gifted, but some people never open their package. Mm. I opened my package a long time ago. I thought, why are they worrying me? Why are people like giving me this negative reception. I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. I'm not in your way. Why Why are you troubled by the way I look? Then it, it hits me. Okay, they acknowledge your existence. You don't read the news. You make the news. So yeah, go on, mm. so let's go there. So here I am today. 
on Bookie's place. Ah, I wish I could read all the comments. Eh, these comments are amazing. Eh, say go when you say you, Bookie, go go you. Bookie, again, those calls just filtered with the audio, so now I can't hear you. So don't use my and lock me out, and then let me request myself. This is perfect. So, um, yeah, that is so touching that they will throw things at you because you look different. Yes. And how how did you mentally cope with that? Uh, let's just say that I have, I, over time, I have embodied resilience, resilience because of all the stones that have been thrown at me. I grew up in a family house, and you guys know what it means to live in a Yoruba family house, where if you're different, they will take it that, oh, you're the devil's advocate. I once lived in an aunt's house, and I remember that they threw me out at midnight because they said my hair was the reason why God was not answering the prayers in that house. And these are like my blood, though. And then when I turned to their son for solace, because whilst I was in Unilag at that point, he was in Lasso as well, I was like, this is what your mom just said and your older sister. And they were like, yeah, get the hell out of our house. So they threw me out at midnight. And, and you know, when I say scenarios like that, I had braced myself for it. I had no formal training from my parents because you see, my dad was out of a job and was trying to make ends meet. My mom was teaching in like four or five different schools. She was too, you know, and for a foreigner, for a woman who is not Nigerian, who is living in a family house, you can imagine what she was going through herself. And then we had numerous cousins. My cousins were the most hateful-minded people on planet life. <laughs> Everything was wrong. I remembered mornings when I was in secondary school, I washed my uniform, I dry. Before I come back, they would have thrown it either in the gutter or the soccer way. I had to wash it again. And wear wet uniform to school every morning. And my uniform, my, my shorts were khaki. So you can, you know khaki does not dry easily. I remember times that we'll be cooking soup, we'll be boiling pepper on the stove. And then by the time maybe you run into the house to get something, you come back, you will see like mucus. Uh. Yeah, sorry, my darling. But no, but you know things like, and then every morning there was always a fresh fight. We, you would, oh, you know, going down memory lane. Wow. It's, it's, it was quite traumatic for me, especially for someone like me growing up. I was in GSS3 at that point in time. And prior to that booking, I lived with an uncle because my parents couldn't afford to send me to secondary school when I got admission to St. Gregory's College. So I went to live with an uncle and staying in my uncle's house. Oh, I was the butler, the errand boy, the cleaner. You know, and then for, because I had to go to school every morning at, um, I had to get to school before eight. I would wake up at 4 a.m. I would sweep. I would, you know, like when you wash with brush and then you dry, then you polish the floors. I did that every day, Monday to Sunday. And I remember that their son was in a, one of the command schools, I think in Ibadan. So all the punishment they used to met upon him. When it comes to the house, I was the experimental guinea pig, the lab rats, who now do Angonite. They will put a tall TV, black and white, those wooden ones on my hand. So I, I mean, I went through all of that until I got thrown out of that house. I remember being thrown out at midnight as well. I was writing my junior work. I slept at the filling station at the Alagomechi bus stop. Showered at the car wash. There was a car wash there. Went to school, wrote my exam. And I was like the um, third in my class. I was in art class. Um, no, yes, art class. Just a three. No, do you know why? Before I got to, in my bag. The black bag. Sorry, we're looking for the earpiece. Can you hear me booking because you're quiet? I'm just touched. I'm, I'm okay. quiet. So, I mean, I wrote my junior work and I came out with five A's and all C's. You know, and, and five distinctions and then all the remaining credits. No pass, no fail, nothing of that sort. And then I started staying in my grandma's house in our family house. I didn't know that was from fire pan to fire. And you see, my, I lived because all the people that we lived with, they were all girls. And I was like one of the youngest. So they took it upon themselves because they couldn't fight my parents. The next person to transfer the aggression on was myself. And they ridiculed me at every opportunity, you know, too. So these girls would gang up against me. There are like 10 of them. I remember one time that it was environmental sanitation. And this I remember clearly. And we're cleaning the gutter. And then this girl just took this masquerade whip and started flogging me. One of my cousins. I'm not going to call her name. 
And I was like, ah, why are you flogging out? Ah, you know, I'm a normal boy now. Then I was in SS2. Ah, no, I'm a give me Ah, don't flog me. What's this? So I'll flog my own back. Home. And my grandma just said, my grandma, and I got dressed her so. Eh, you are talking to your older cousin like that. Before I knew it, all of them had ganged up. And they beat me right in front of our family house. On Bonue in Alagomichi. I took that be beating like a man. Imagine six girls beating you at once, left, right, center. I took it like a man, you know. And I just knew that it was because they wanted to get back at my parents, especially my mom. Because, you know, my mom was a fighter. You know, they tried, they did everything to try and kill my spirit, bring us down. And then by the time I started dressing a certain kind of way, every day they'll tell me I'm a disgrace to the family. Um, Yaba left is looking for me. I'm trying, I'm hoping that they'll discover me, but I'll never be discovered you know, and stuff like that. And then, well, who's having the last laugh now? Bookie, when I entered our family church, the previous one, oh, you think that Barack Obama has arrived? <laughs> and then my so-called cousins, you know, like, when we celebrated my grandma's funeral, when she passed on, everybody wanted to take pictures with me, and this is like five years ago, six years ago, everybody wanted to take pictures. Oh, at that point now, they really deserve to be celebrated, acknowledged, appreciated, and recognized. But then I did not, like I said, it was just a transition. I knew that it was going to pass. I knew it was a phase that would pass, you know, and I just did not let it define me, break my spirit, or try and dampen my creativity. Because, hey, Nigeria is a country that stifles creativity back to back. I refused to let that be my narrative. I changed my narrative. I rewrote my family history, and I broke down all the walls of bullying, of segregation, of cancel culture, self, because I was canceled in my family house and whatnot. And here we are today, rising stronger oh. than the tide. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not really about this. So it just feels, um, you know, it is it's well. It, it, is, it is amazing that you're doing this for us. This is amazing. So we said no questions are off bounds. Okay. So. How did you how did you embrace because you've told us how you handled rejection, right? Yeah, you yes, had to, yes. yeah. So how did you embrace the difference? How what when was the first time you found out and how did you embrace it? You know what I'm saying? And you, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I like I said, I knew I was different, but I just did not know who to talk to and how to go about it. There was no manual for it. We had no TV in my house. We couldn't even afford to buy a TV. Eventually, when I gathered money from all my small, small modeling gigs here and there, and I managed to buy a black and white TV, it was even as erratic as myself. It was so scrambled. We had to slap it and slap it before the picture would be static. But, you know, I didn't even know Charlie Boy when I started out my hustle until I became a backup dancer for Charlie Boy's wife, Lady D. I used to do some backup dance for two shorts. If you remember, um, Steve, Ole, carry and go. Only you, only you, only you know the phrase. Steve, Ole, carry and carry go. And go. go. Then move your body, make you shake that thing where you get. Eh? Mm -hmm. Then the music enter your head. Okay, so we used to do a lot of backup dancing for as many artists as we could, all in a bid for visibility, for recognition. Yeah. And then, you know, to get busy, we're not getting paid, but we enjoyed it. Yeah. And I think that at that time that I started doing all of the dance and whatnot, I just knew that there was just something. There was an element to me that was alien to, like, as I said, everybody else. And I started to embrace it when I knew that everybody just wanted me around, either for my good vibes or for my energy or, I mean, whatever it was, they just wanted me around. And again, it was a reminder to the fact that they really they are going to be instrumental to taking your family to the next level. I don't know, I always had that at the back of my mind. And I just wanted to work so hard not necessarily make all the money in the world because, I mean, there was really no money at that point in time, but just work really hard and make it happen. Okay, I need a power bank right now. Today, sorry the bank, the power bank. Before you go, Kuma, be So, what is your power bank? Is it here? So, embracing my difference and embracing my creative... Ac ac acknowledging. You know, we yes. talked about practical tools. It. I like that acknowledgement. Acknowledging it, aside from the negative reception, I just knew that, okay, so people are talking about me. We don't read the news, we make the news. Okay, and let's go on. So let's do what we have to do. And again, it just comes with inner strength. 
I watched my mom because, you know, my mom, as I said, is not Nigerian. My mom lived in a family house. Another foreign woman would have just carried her children midnight. Oh, yeah. Let's go to my country. But she's stuck in Nigeria and said, you know what? I'm not only going to make this marriage work. I'm going to take care of these children. My husband might not be doing so much. Their dad might be a bit, you know, financially handicapped right now. But let me do what I can do. My mom, who is not a certified teacher, was teaching in like two schools. She was doing private tutoring. I mean, she's a linguist. She's multilingual. So she started teaching French and German, you know. And then it's surprising that most of the students that I taught in the primary school I used to work at are all doing great now. A lot of them reach out to me. Uncle De Rele, I'm doing my master's now in AT. And I'm like, no. You know, all of that really empowered me. And then again, I would also say that a lot of parents, they don't want me around their children. For some weird reason. So I had a lot of friends in the area. But guess what? Every time I go to their friends, work me out. So I'm like, so I was alone. And then I said, okay, I'm not going to be alone. I'm not going to die with my isolation. I am going to what? work really hard. So I occupied my mind. Like I said, there was no manual. There was no TV. There was no social media. So if I, as a young person, can occupy my mind actively and accurately, I feel that every young person should do that right now. I can see you now. I can okay, see you now. Okay, shout you. out to Omar Slavoj, one of the first generation of catwalk and commercial models that went international. We won, you know, a lot of competitions and then settled in South Africa, was in a proper modeling agency, started his business, came to Nigeria for Big Brother, and then, hey, he's a household name. Shout out to Swanky Jerry. Bookie, do you know Swanky Jerry? The, the mm. synonymous superlative, supersonic stylist. No swanky, no styling. Swanky Jerry is also one of the people who, uh, let me use the word, um, I was, he was like my protege. And he's such, uh, he's built a successful brand for himself. And what, guess what? One of those Sound City blast parties that you performed at back in 2007, 2008, Swanky Jerry was still in secondary school. I gave him an invite. He came to the event because he was such a huge fan of yours. And guess what? Hmm. The next day, he got to school because it was on a Sunday. On Monday, they flogged them because they got to school late. But then they had all the pictures with all the celebrities. Then with all our BBM phones. And I remember that you were in one of those pictures. Are you so serious? They flogged Jerry because of you. <laughs> How can I be in one picture and then I'm flogging him because of me? <laughs> well, let's just say that. Uh, because we're dancing Morine, Morine, Morine. Take easy, I can see you. Take easy. <laughs> Whoa, uh -huh. So I'm usually laughing, he knows. And look at this event was um, the Sound City Blast. It was like, you know, the pre-event, the prequel to the Sound City Music Video Awards. If you uh -huh. remember attending all the time. Yes. You were such a proud supporter of the Sound City brand. Yeah. And um, I remember that it was at Osh, um, Ocean Front. Uh, what's that place? Ocean View. Beside a hotel. If you remember. Do you remember when we went to um on that Sound City oh, Blast? Oh, we that they, they put Every gun beside you. Yes. We went to Ekiti. That's Ado Ekiti. We went to Osu. Osu was a very terrorizing one where, you know, things went down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Swanky remembers Ocean View. Yes, Ocean View right beside the hotel. Yeah. And Swanky Jerry was so inspired by my own outfit. He also wore his own jacket with pins and Swords and then so I said, and tomorrow, tomorrow is the yard uh, that he will jump to. <laughs> no, he jumped the game well. Though. And now Swanky has built a beautiful fashion conglomerate. Shout out to Swanky. Yeah, me see. Ah, I'm a Methodist church. Oh, I'm me. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, me and I will be youth church. Shout out to yeah, me see you. Tell, tell us about this Osu thing before we continue your story. Okay. Remember that this, mm -hmm. this is the time that I knew that Buki had mind. <laughs> B O U Q U I. This is my slow. Buki na man will be. Na man will be. All right, so guys, it was the NK Found City Campus Plus, you know, and then we would sit down in the office and construct like a special list of entertainers who would, might not go for every show. The major ones, like, you know, Tubaba and Divanch and Nice, we would split them, but then. Artists like Buki, whose songs were everywhere, they cut across. Buki, Lord of Ajasa, uh, okay, Peace Square, where the, you know, we took Peace Square to Joss and Abuja, 
and then we took nice to uh Ekiti and I think Osu and then we took two baba to Meduguri and do you know, you know, do you know that do you know that nice that was the last time I saw nice because he opened for what? us and when I went to when I came back from Yankee they said nice is ah, nice is everywhere he has blown I said nice <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> so guys let me quickly give you this bit though mm -hmm. now we come go Osu so Buki had done um, UI with us, University of Ibadan. She had done Unilag. She had done um, Adjoy Kitty. And then we're now going to the famous Osu. Oh, the moment we got to the hotel, first things first, they had broken all the locks. So all the doors at uh, right in the hotel had no locks. So anybody could badge in at any time. And then when we now got on campus, ah, our boy is ah, ah, we don't sell it. Hey, we don't see what? And you don't know about it. Who can do that? <laughs> and there was so much drama going on. Even me, they kept, you know, taking my microphone from me. They were beating our cameraman up. Before, so a lot of us just went on and the place was pandemonium. And Bookie was coming on. Bookie usually was like the only girl on most of these trips with us. You know, or more. When Bookie came on stage, hey! When you say you go road and road and I think he was now dreading how to come off the stage because by then it was like a stampede. People were clamoring to even bring the stage down. Bookie just I remember that you just you were signaling to me. I signaled to your manager. So we just called the security guy. They lifted Bookie off the stage. But forget that lifting as they put that in the bus. The show was over. I mean, I think nice and um, I can't remember who the headline is. P square, P square, P square. Yeah, P square. Thank you. Yeah, they already gone to the hotel. When we got to the hotel, there were boys outside the hotel. Wait, no, remember the boss? They were shaking the boss yeah, like no, this, no, like. The, boss. The, the drive to the hotel was like horrendous. It was quite. It was like a tsunami. And then we got to the hotel. There were no lock. And I remember that Bookie came to hide in my room because we moved <laughs> from the country. And then all the boys were outside. Wait, ah, I want to enter the room. Ten thousand dollars, no money. Who care about them two? We are going. We are going for each other. I remember that line. I do you know, remember. But then we settled them that night in the morning. We finally managed to reach Scotland. But the night before that, you know, transition into that morning, we did not sleep. Myself, Buki, Peter, P Square, Paul, a nice lot of Ajasta, and Conga. Earthquake! 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 Earthquake. Ah, Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. <laughs> in short, all of us were bunched up in a room, you know, with um, the Sound City brand manager, Shile, and then yeah. um, our producer, Michael. And then um, we had a new VJ that joined us at that point. Olamide Oshoka was his name. He currently works with TBT right now. So we're all bunched up in a room, and we're like, ah. Um, and then when we beep, you see boys outside. Hey, that they go. <laughs> so we finally them came out and we managed to leave in one piece. Not remember, do you remember that they took did you remember they took your phone? Yes, now Re I remember that you came to us and you said, Guess what just happened to me now? That someone just put a gun to me and collected my yes. phone. And we See, were like, we were looking at you. You said it was just very it might not he even have been a gun, but whatever yeah, it was, who wants to find out? <laughs> I was holding my microphone. Yeah, this is Sound City, Nigeria as well, live and direct. So I just felt something, you know, very cold, cold metal on my waist. So, wow, Buluti, wow, I'm a Sound City, bro. Ah, bro, she, bro. I love that shit, yeah, I'm here. So I just, my cameraman was even shaking with the camera that time. Nah, if they collect the camera from me, hold me down. So he was shaking. He said, wow, phone it up, phone it up. He, now took, he even took my phone and said I should call the MTN brand manager. He, I wow. called him. I said, yeah, it'll be 100,000. Wow, 100 k. I think that, you know, all of these beautiful memories. Are, but so because I've been through a lot growing up, I just said to myself, nothing will happen. It's not our time to go. Ah, mm. We still have a lot to do. So, a lot to and do. Boy, I was telling the guy, wow, <laughs> far And he was going, I said, what do you want to shoot on my body? Memories, memories. You have a part. I don't even remember half of this, but you have a perfect memory. I do, I do. So we're going back to your story now. And the last thing you said was about your cousins and you know how you were 
Uh, uh, network, don't misbehave. Oh. The, um, Telling Paul. What that yeah. video call that was calling from France is actually my uncle because he was on the live. So. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> so he, he, like, he's never really seen anything. I don't know how. Ah, Elipo, you want to. Ah, Elipo, yeah. <laughs> Elipo, <laughs> don't call him now. But I don't know if he's buy now. He said we will continue to. Ah, oh, Atlanta. America, somebody. No, sorry. Professor Elipo. <laughs> Professor. Mm. 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 See, mm. Elipo is also very. She's someone who I can also say has mentally been a gift to my mental success story. Helen Paul and I used to do some hustling back then, you know, back in the day. And I was going to pick Helen Paul was in Unilag. I was going to pick her up with my driver, Mr. Ismail. Yeah. We'll go and go city people entertainment. I was in Abel Kuta. We'll leave. We'll go to an, even Helen Paul's wedding. I remember going to her wedding. And, I, you know, her mom and her family members were like, ah, Helen Talili. <laughs> you know, and then Helen told her mom, Mommy, leave my friend alone. And I just stop already. Leave him alone, you know. So just one of those beautiful times that you shared beautiful men. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. Paul, so, shout yeah. And shout out to you, Helen. So, that time. Helen Paul, let me not too Shiri. Not to family plan is online. I'm a new one that me. If we go to really like we just there was a certain let, ah, I don't want to call his designation. His job says okay, let me say it. There was a certain actor that will come to any small stair. In my mind, I say you that you are going to fall down stairs. If a man shake with oh, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I grew up in Yaba together, so he just knew that I was very protective of this friend of mine. Helen, yeah. I love you. Mwah. Helen, we love you. I've known Helen since oh. even before I started singing. Well, the record she was working at the record label that I was signed to, Echo yeah. FM. So that's how I yeah. knew Helen. Yes, yes. Anyway, back to your story. And I told you before that what we do here is we practically equip people with tools, right, that they can use. And the last question yeah. I asked you was, how did you acknowledge? that you were different and how did you embrace the fact that you are different and you answered it uh melvin send dm me your number i honor you too this, ah, this, uh, <laughs> melvin, no, do you to be mommy? <laughs> melvin, no. melvin's nickname is what booze and this is how you say it. booze <laughs> melvin is just like you there do it where is he I said, this is coming. <laughs> the is coming. <laughs> Melvin is also another amazing, hardworking individual. Shout out to you, Melvin Odua. Yeah, and then I know. From the big brother, Africa, the chase. Ah. I know, I know, I know. Yes, yes. Okay. So, you've answered that question. Did you answer it to your yeah. heart's content? Well, how did so you? How did you acknowledge? How did you first? How did you identify? How did you acknowledge that you were different? And how did you embrace it? Did you answer that to your heart's content? Not quite. I feel that, you know, like, let me use Nigeria. The totality of Nigerians will always frown on things that are different. The demographic of Nigerians will always frown at things that they are not used to. They find difference. They can't understand. They simply cannot comprehend. And they just would attach some sort of spiritual problems to. So everyone either thought that I was one a video, I was one of Banjo, or I was one which or maybe I needed urgent Yaba left attention. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my aunts saying it. She'll come to the house, Alaba, you know, and I think that acknowledging it, aside from all the negative perception, reception, and uh, you know, comprehension I was getting from people all around me, I think it came down to the fact that at the home front. My parents, my dad and my mom kind of knew that, you know what, let's let this child express himself. So it was about expressing my individuality and my outlook was an extension of my personality. Mm. If at any point I was insecure, I was shy, I was withdrawn, I was worried about expressing myself, you know what, acknowledging my difference, when I acknowledged it, I was not ready. I said to myself, you know what, I don't give a damn. I'm going anywhere, walking with my head high. And I remember a certain scenario. I was sharing this with someone. And I'll just quickly say this. 
So you remember uh, the Fuji House of Commotion? Yeah. Popular speech from back in the day. This was like 2000, 2001, you know. And I remember going for one of the auditions. I even got the form. The form was 2005. Ah, I saved up. I bought the form. And then I went to audition. God bless Amaka Igwe's soul. I mean, Auntie Amaka, God bless you. I remember walking in. And you know how it is when you go for auditions. And then the, the audition time is at 8 a.m. You get there at 7.30 and you're like number 350 something. I was like, ah, okay. So finally, people were going in one after the other. But when it got to our turn, there were too many people. It was already 9 p.m. And for someone like me, I was scared to buy food because I was starving, but I did not have enough transport money. And I didn't want to go away. Hence, they might call my number and I'll miss, you know, the mark. So I just wanted to stay put. And we finally started entering in droves of 10. And when I got in, there was a panel. You know, they were asking us questions. And then they looked particularly interested in me. And they were asking me, and they said, okay, this hair of yours, is it natural? I said, ah, yes. You know, then I was a popular commercial model. So I was like, yeah. And they said, would you cut your hair for your role? And I said, ah, if you people are blessing me with the right figures, I will <laughs> do for the papa. But it will go down well with everyone. You know, at times, some jokes go bad. This joke was a sad joke. So somebody on the panel already took an instant dislike to me for saying that. Of course, everybody in the room laughs, but this person did not find it funny. And then they told us to act. You know, they were asking us questions. And then when it was time for that person to interview me, he said, okay, so you're coming here thinking you're like, what? You are it? You're telling us is what will give us, what will give you that will make you cut your hair? Who the hell do you think you are? I thought he was joking. I thought he was acting and trying to get my emotion. So I kind of responded nicely and I was like, oh no. And then he said, keep quiet. You don't know what you're saying. Look at look at the way you're dressed. It's like disgraced first. If I was your father, I would disown you and I'll throw you over Todd Mayland Bridge. Eh? I was like, ah, Lori audition. Eh, <laughs> what I know? <laughs> I know. I'm really sorry, sir. I was apologizing. I was like, okay, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean it that way, you know. And he said, keep quiet. People like you will never go places. You come here to audition, you come in and you think you know it all. I say, ha. Ah. I just made a joke. He said, shut up. You will never make it in this industry. I huh. said, I. And he said, come on, get out. Get out. And you know, the moment we got out, like I said, I'm a strong-minded individual. And I was like, I was just like this. So all the other guys that came in with me were like, I give me the shoes. I said that Pele, and you did so well. Oh, hey, why now? Hey. You know, if I'd done it alone, it would have been my cross to bear. But everybody else saw it. And it just went, started spreading around the room that, you know, people were like, hey, you two, why did you carry this? Hey, you see, now why are you dressed like this? And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to deal with this. I said, it's not my time. Mm -hmm. Let me carry my wish and go. If it was meant for me, eh, but I don't think it's so, so I left. And then, fast forward to now, I would say that that person who insulted me recently apologized to me. It's an episode that is still fresh in my head because, I mean, it is something that I know a lot of young people go through. Mm -hmm. We're missing touched by appearance, by outlook, by many things we say. And I feel that we need to be patient enough to listen to young people. I mean, the person didn't even know who I was. Who are you to? You're not God to tell me that I would not make it in whatever yeah. industry. Right now, like, this is somebody who I would say that I've helped continuously, but I mean, that's another story for another day. But I just feel that God has elevated me to a level that I would not look down on people that are also looking for this same table Thanks. and the same groups. Mm. Mm. And we're all on earth for a reason. I said this earlier, I said, the greatest form of activism is for you to be a living, living example of the kind of people you like to walk this earth with. Be an advocate for your truth and also an advocate for people who find it unsafe to walk in their own truth. Be a light that. So, yes. at that mm. point, I just knew, you know what? My brand, my identity, my essence, my aura might not go down well with everyone. But guess what? You might not be everybody's cup of tea. And that's fine. Not everybody's going to like you. And that's fine. Those who like you will like you. Those who will stand by you will stand by you. And those who don't like you will, guess what? They are your confused admirers. Mm. And we call them haters, Abby. I have an acronym for haters. H-A-T-E-R-S. Hating at those experiencing real success. Yes. 
<laughs> and somebody says, Dear Elaine, do you remember the person's face and name? Of course, now. Of course. Uh, uh, I would just say that. I just knew I was different. I knew it was not good down, it was not going to go down well with a lot of people. I knew a lot of people were going to segregate, sideline, cancel, if possible, said, look for ways to throw me under the bus. But I did not let all of those perceptions knock me down. Lie, lie. What, you want to put me in a box? I will jump right out of it. Give me the See, <laughs> let me tell you, a lot of people don't, yeah. well, you, you said something about Charlie Boy, that you had no point of reference when you started. Yes. You just knew you were different. So I want you yeah. to delve in. These are things you probably never said to anybody before. But this is Bookie's Place and it's a safe zone. It's just you and me, you know. What is your kind of difference? My kind of difference, self-expression. That's what I stand for. I'm an advocate for self-expression. I'm an advocate for individuality and expressing your individuality and owning it. Hashtag own thy truth. Hashtag own thy originality. I'm also an advocate for believing that being different is not only the best revenge ever, it is the greatest self-confidence booster. Mm. And when you look in the mirror and you say, yes, I did it, you own it. And if you own it, you own your difference, you own your uniqueness, you own your authenticity, you own your self-definition. I always tell people that, you see, the beauty to brand values, number one, self-definition two authenticity three accountability because hey you gotta make money four longevity and consistency i've been i've been gaming since 1994 and i mean people will say all kinds now oh they really I've, i even saw comments about oh yes my enemy's dead career and whatnot but guess what not everything i do ends up on social media 90 percent of my life doesn't make it on social media but let me not digress and then Last on the list is relatability. I am a Nigerian. And I will speak my Nigerian English anywhere I go with my proud Nigerian accent. I have traveled far and wide and to wherever I go, if you cannot comprehend what I'm saying, I am not going to switch to your own lingua. You must get me and get me nicely. And I think that is why my brand has been very relatable because I appeal to every demographic. Young people know me, teenagers know me, adolescents do. Even old people, they really only love my rim. And if you want me, my man. And that is why I get all kinds of gigs. I work with all kinds of clients. I work with every single brand, agencies, and whatnot. And I think that it's very expansive for me because I know I'm not only appealing to a certain crowd, a certain audience, but I appeal to practically everyone. And we're getting to a point in life this generation, Generation Z, I think that a lot of them look up to people like us for guidance. Like, ah, you know, like, I love your expressiveness. I want to express myself. Parents, call me now and say, my daughter wants to do this. My son wants to do this. But we're not sure how to kickstart this. What can you do? So it might shock you, but it might come across as strange to people. You, how are you? I'm not, I'm not going to use the word role model because that's quite heavy. It's a heavyweight. I would use advocates yeah i say how you parents are calling i go to a lot of secondary schools i go to a lot of primary schools motivate inspire young people and i have a lot of parents calling me back to back and i know because i used to be a teacher i understand how to communicate with young people especially mm. students you know and i know how to drag them out of their cell because i believe that everybody's gifted but some people never open their packages so if mm. i'm going to be a spokesperson to show people how to open their packages at a very young age yeah Open your package and grab your talent now. And be so, everything yeah. that you're supposed to be. Exactly. Yes. Girl. Yes. <laughs> and you said something that we're gonna we're, we're going deeper now. So you said they tell you go and marry, go and marry, and it brings me to the part of sexuality. Yes. People want to box people. People want to label. Rightfully so. So tell me. What is your sexuality? Okay, so I have answered this question 700 million times every <laughs> single day and every single year. And at times, I have gotten to a point where I have like fabricated answers because I just want to create that air of mystery and whatnot. So I will tell people, oh, 
I'm a sexual outlaw. And everybody wonders, what is that sexual outlaw? Where did that come from? And I just said it just for the fun of it. I mean, I'm over that right now because I felt that that answer would just keep people, sh would not necessarily shut them up, but would just leave them pondering on what you just said. So I've been labeled all kinds of sexuals. I've been labeled metrosexual, bisexual, homosexual, sexual, sexual, uh, asexual, solo sexual. What other sexual is there that have called me all the sexuals? And I think that it gets to a point in your life where when you're great at your craft, when your, your deliverables are on point, when you're good at your job, there has to be a loophole somewhere. So they are looking. And then it comes that, and you see that whole sexual orientation and preference. That question arises because I am not, like as I said, your average quintessential Niger brother. Because I may appear effeminate in nature, then it already means that I am already swinging through the back door. Mm. Or because I am flamboyant in disposition and colorful, you know, I have a colorful personality and I might, you know, just appear all over the place and vivacious. Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, yeah. As the Nigerians, as the Yoruba people say, Oh, Mr. Shwami. <laughs> So, like I said, I've gotten all kinds of labels. I've gotten all kinds. I've been labeled all kinds. But I know myself. I understand who I am. I bask in my essence and my aura. And I'm truly living my life. I go to bed at night peacefully. I want to say this. Who you go to bed with is different from who you go to bed as. Mm. I go to bed as they really. Who I go to bed with is I feel that it's not even the issue here. Or what I do in my one corner, one corner, one corner, or in the other room, I really feel it's not a defining factor. But I'll bring it here very quickly. I'll just say one or two things so you can try and figure out the orientation. Mm -hmm. So I've not been very lucky with love, or lucky in love, more or less. And maybe because of the strong, overwhelming personality that I am, I've tried to tone it down for a lot of people, but that also means me living out of my comfort zone. And Don't mean yourself down. Life. Don't mean yourself yeah. down. Yes. So I remember, I mean, there was somebody very special in my life. We're still good friends till date. You know, would have been someone that I would have gotten married to, but she's married now with twins. I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I know that story. So. <laughs> she met her husband at my birthday party. I actually introduced them together. I was like, okay, you'll be walking the red carpet. Her husband now was working with Showtime Africa owned by TA. Of course, you already know what I'm talking about. Right? And I was like, you of guys will be walking the red carpet together. So if you interview a celebrity, please pass to this person. You know, it was my birthday party now. So I was feeling, oh, red carpet. This was like 2007. My party was the party of the whole. That was even the party where it was alleged that Banky W had slapped one of my friends. Who actually... Is Sophia Lakija's older sister, Sophia Lakija, the actress. But let's not get into all of that. And it just didn't work out. And for everybody else, I remember that I met someone that I liked. She just got married recently. And I tried to downplay my exuberance, my effervescent, uh, my effervescent nature. How would I put it? My loquaciousness. Because this, I, I think that at the end of the day, I might just end up with somebody who is mild. Because she was just like a timid beautiful human being like we have the same taste in different things we have beautiful interests we have a lot in common mm. now she have married i didn't go to her wedding she invited me but i couldn't go it would have been painful to watch not necessarily though so i think i'm at a point in my life now where i'm not looking because when you're constantly looking and your your expectations are high you're constantly anticipating you're on edge and i don't think i want to be defined by that narrative I'm not currently looking. I am having the best time of my life. I am so at peace with myself. For crying out loud, Buki, I'm going to be 40 next year. And I look like I just wrote my junior work. Woo! Gang, you are meeting yeah. us there. I already, I already crossed that last year now. I, I want to... Oh, I want to pay for tea. I am the highlight of your control. <laughs> you, are, you are 40, 40, man. <laughs> and I think at the end of the day, marriage, relationships, situationships, entanglement, they don't really define us as human beings. 
mm. your sexual orientation, your sexual preference, what not. I have slightly evaded the question, but let's just say I am not only a sexual outlaw, but I'm the most adventurous and experimental human being alive. Bah. Well. <laughs> so that answers the, it. That answers the question, you know, but you said yes. something that I'm going to use. Is that yours originally or you created it? Let me say, you said who you go to be bed with is not as important as who you go to bed as. Yes. Punch the line. I'm going to Punch use that. <laughs> Wow, wow. Do, do you think you do you think because your mom is not Nigerian that had to do with the 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 um the willingness to let you be who you are? You think if it was a Nigerian mom, you would have had that liberty to I express. I think you see my mom was caught up in too many things. My mom was caught up with not only fending for her kids. Because, like I said, I did not have your regular kind of childhood. I didn't have mm -hmm. toys. I had toys, well, as a toddler. But then, you know, as a teenager, I didn't have, like, everything at my expenses. I, I was, I would look at my back and core. I didn't have clothes. I had, like, two shirts, three jeans. Most times, I would end up wearing my school uniform to church. Wow. And I remember the day that I was trying to iron my trousers, and I burnt it. Hey! I cried because I knew that I was not going to stress my mother for another uniform. So I ended up patching it and I was wearing patchwork every day. And I got made fun of so much. You know what I mean? Growing up, of course, I was bullied, the usual. But I think my own bullying always came from people making fun of me because I didn't have. So they used to call me poor Indian boy. You know, I don't go away from that poor boy. Poor boy. You know, and I even remember that, you know, so growing up in Yaba. I used to go visit my friends in the next, you know, on the next axis of Alagumeji. And then, you know, my friends, that, like my age mates, they had older brothers. They had a pool house. So they used to play snooker. And so they had a lot of, you know, young guys in the area that used to come and play snooker. A certain set of brothers, I remember them well, they used to call me lesbian. I just did not understand. So whenever they would see me, this lesbian, come and get out of here. I said, hey, yeah. I did not come to look for you. I am not playing snooker. I'm not even in your way. How is this lesbian even getting in your way? Ow, ow. They called me lesbian every single day. And then there was a time they even pushed me in the gutter. You know? Okay, why am I talking about all of this right now? I'm trying to... But I just... You know me, I can digress for Africa. No, go I ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so, hey, what, okay, what brought me to... What was it that you asked Steph again? Hey. I said, if your mom, if your mom was not oh, yeah, Nigerian, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if she yeah. was Nigerian. So, I, because my mom was caught up in all of that and trying to fend for the home front and trying to fight the family members back to that country. My mother is very, she's a defender of the universe. Also, trying to protect her children, trying to fend for them, trying to make us not feel isolated and whatnot, trying to also protect her husband's interests. Because I remember my mom going to all our Indian friends who were doing well and asking them to please help her husband out with the job. And then they would tell her, ah, ah, Anita. Her name is Anita Atwaru. Atwaru, what are you doing with this man? You leave him, you go back to India, go back to Mauritius. You, what are you doing with this God-forsaken Nigerian Yoruba man? You know, and whatnot. But my mom just stuck. So I think that for me, it wasn't even that my mom wasn't even really paying attention to me more, more or less. And that's why I had to become a father figure for my younger siblings. Because I had to just take myself out of that, the chains of poverty. And say, you know what? I had to work extra hard and I'm going to take this family to the next level. So, it didn't have anything to do with my mom. It didn't have anything to do with my dad. I think they also let me express myself freely. Like, oh, don't worry, you'll be tired of it. That's what they thought. You will grow out of it or whatnot. And, um, at the point, my mother would ask me, like, why are you dressing this way? <laughs> but, you know, she was not too tired, too, because I saw it. My mother was always getting tired. You know, and then my mom became a staunch prayer warrior at MFM. My mom currently lives in Dublin, in Ireland, and she's like an MFM pastor in MFM wow. Dublin. Yeah, correct prayer warrior. And you see, my mom 
was just about protecting the spirituality of her children and ensuring that their stars are not doomed. Because he must have said something to her about this boy, this son of yours. I rem- oh my God, I remember one time I followed my mom to MFM. Hey! And then after praying, as we're coming out, one of the senior pastors came to my mom and greeted her. And then I said, now looked at me and said, Auntie, when next you come to church, please cover your head. Hey, I just said that my mother was going to beat me from that only girl to Yaba. I said, I couldn't even start explaining that. Oh, I'm not an auntie, I'm an uncle, but my mother just gave me that look. You know mothers now? When we entered bus. Oh! And my mother can slap for Africa and slap for Africa. Cut your hair, cut your hair, you stupid boy. You know, so I think that because she was caught up in so much, she was just about, I hope my children find guidance and I hope they find the right direction. And I hope that, you know, they make something for themselves and not end up in this family house till eternity and not be, you know, dependent on this family, but they should break free. So because I saw that she was getting so stressed, her hair was thinning and falling out, I just said to myself, you know what? Seize the momentum. I started working very hard, put money together, and then we got my mom to travel out of Nigeria. She even traveled on an expired passport. It was grace. I just said, you know what? My mom, I told her, I said, just go. Me, I want to do everything. Go. So we, she, we booked tickets, you know, and whatnot. Of course now, they always just thought my mom would never be able to go back to her country. That's family members. So they were constantly always, you know, insulting us with that. I remember my dad had a Honda Accord. And I remember my cousin, they wake up in the morning, they start shouting, Kalo, Kalo, Ka. Kalo, Kalo, Ka. You know, like, one cousin even said to me one time that, I have never seen your kind of going go before. Wretched, dejected, like, this kind of half caste. I don't know. This is the poorest level of half caste parenting I've ever seen. Hey, it is worship. Well, Let's thank God for life. Let's wow. thank God for life. Let's thank God for grace. Let's thank God for growth. And let's thank God for elevation. Baba God. So no matter that, that's the thing now, okay. No matter what people say to me now, because you see, back then it was upfront confrontation. People stop me on the streets, insult me, call me all kinds of names. But you know now with the advent of social media, you have a lot of faceless identities typing non-stop and saying mm-hmm. all kinds. You're know, right, I like anybody. You've seen what I do, but you don't know what I've been through. Uh, my dear, I mean, know my story myself. So, yeah. Welcome to wow. our reality check. It's called my reality check. There it is, reality check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. And I'm and, and like, oh, wow, this is so touching. You know, I told you before that what we do, we try to do, is use our story to equip people with practical yes. tools. How did you find the mental capacity to pull through? What was your secret yeah. weapon? What, hey. How did you, you, you know, because as humans, as you humans, if they yes. say a word to you, it will first land. What you hmm. now do with that is what will determine if it stays with you or you shake it off. Oh. What did you do? I am still saying to myself, I'm still trying to process that question and how I found my way around the madness and um, around the trials and tribulations that I had to go through. But I'm just going to say, you know what? I always thought that recovery was finding something that I thought I had. Uh, no, I thought I lost. Lost, yes. Because to me, I thought it was finding something I thought I lost. But I never knew that it was finding the strength I never thought I had. Mm. Recovery of purpose. Or purpose of recovery. And for me, again, like I said, it was just about breaking down those walls of, you know, the chains of poverty, rewriting my family history, changing my narrative, and of course, building a strong foundation for myself. I did it alone. Mm. Doors were constantly shut in my faces. Nobody wanted to give me a chance. Everybody just thought I was just some outcast of some sorts walking down the street who would probably end up, you know, in a Yabalev area. But here I am today. A living testimony, a shining example. Yeah, we might fail to admit and say, what kind of example? What was he preaching? But yes, a shining example of the fact that you can overcome your hurdles. You can come out of nothing and make something out of that absolute nothing. You are not something. You are everything. Bah. And then I think that at the end of the day, 
I'm just, that's why, like I said, I'm at a good place in my life where I can sit now. I mean, I lived in a room, cramped space. And every time I wanted to use the toilet or anything, it was a problem. Because it was, you know, family house at the back. Once you're using the toilet, that's when your cousins will come out. Uh -huh. They'll know there's no water, they'll start, we must flush. And then they'll have one to your bed, pa. <laughs> then they will come, you know, and then I will have to trek. I remember fetching water back to back. I will walk from places like, from, uh, let me think of a very nice, okay, let me use New York now as a sidetrack, as a template. I will walk from like 34th Street to like 40, 45th Street. Of, wow. You know, and then because I'm fetching water, and then get fighting, we'll go to the we'll fight at the top. Ah, my goodness. It is well. It is well. That's all I would say. It is well. And um, mm. I'm, I'm at a point where I refuse to let any... Yeah, I think it was just because I was wired differently. You know, everybody is... We're all unique in our own rights, but then we're wired differently. Yeah. <laughs> we're wired, differently wired. And I just got strength from all of these things that were happening. I prepared my mental capacity. But like I said, I had no mentor growing up. I had no... Me I had... Nobody to talk to. Like I said, my parents didn't really have time because they were dealing with so much on their own end. And I was just more about, let me make this work for myself because I know that it will be beneficial to the people around me. So, yeah, from that matchbox I was in, finally, you know, by the time my grandma passed on and they started, do you know what they started doing to family house? They even started breaking the roof and my dad was in the house. And I just woke up to see concrete falling on him. I said, ah, oh yeah, this is the time. And I went and got like a six, a duplex. And I made sure everyone had their room. Now I live in a place, I'm very comfortable where I'm at. You know, like, and let's, like I said, just thank God for grace, for growth, for expansion, for elevation, and for life. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Listen, that was a wonderful wonderful way to put it do you think you you want to bring your mom back to stay with you now that you're very comfortable my mother's wala is not here oh <laughs> my mother has been saying when are you you crazy boy what are you doing in nigeria when are you going to marry my mom went to teach this and go and bought me wedding ring two wedding bands and sent it and so yeah go and my mother said oh it's not there to marry i'll just carry me and wrap it on somebody's finger like that uh -uh. Uh-uh. That is to marry, eh? You know, but I think that my mom in Dublin is perfect. My mother is Wala. So as she's in that Dublin, let her just be there. She's sweeting me as she's there. Wow. My mother is a fighter. But you know, like now those like I said, like cousins, relatives, people that constantly give me like negative reception and whatnot now would you know once you be found in the somebody. But, but honestly, truth be told, we're all, I'm in a good headspace right now and a beautiful mind space. Headspace is on point, mind space is on point. My mom, Anita Edu, is bowling in Dublin. <laughs> but of course, she said she wants to come once this whole pandemic has cemented for a minute. Because I know Dublin is on lockdown and she wants to come to her. And it would be nice to have her around. And then make sure that after one month, she's back in her country. <laughs> and my mother is going to scrutinize everybody that comes to visit me. You know, uh, uh, you know how people like that can be. She will scrutinize. She, who is the one that is coming to marry? Oh, my God. She gave that media girl headache. Hey! And my mother was caught me in the parlor. See you. They all went to church. My mom. My dad went. Because my dad, you know, he's Pentecostal. So he went to Methodist church. My grandma, they all went to church for... Lent. My mom had gone. To, I thought my mom had gone to MFM. So me, I smuggled in one bad girl. When the panel were running the operation, my mother just entered. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So my mother has always seen me as very sexually active. Like these boys' hormones are raging. So any woman, anybody, she just sit around. Me. Why are you there? My mother gave it to that girl hot hot too, and I tried to defend the girl. My mother, like, so this is what you come and do. This girl like, ah, no man, no man. I went in the living room. I was not saying ah, that she just came. My mother gave me hot slap. <laughs> said, Let me just excuse myself from here. You know, just wow. thinking about these things that they're playing in my head. Like, wow, it's so vivid. And there was no lights that day, so me and girl were sweating. 
Buki kau ada ya So Daryl, would you say would you say your dad is more liberal? Because you said your dad lives with you now. Would you say your dad is more liberal? I think my dad is. See, I I think points, and I'm not supposed to say this. I was quite angry at my dad because I felt like. I was doing like practically everything you should have been doing or should have done. You know, I was shouldering everybody's responsibility. Even those family members that were so against me, who from with all their problems. My dad's old. Okay, I really don't want to go into all of that. But I was shouldering too much, and at a point, I was nearly angry at my dad. Like, I mean, I felt that I should be enjoying the fruits of my labor and not everybody else. I also was angry at the fact that maybe he didn't lay the right foundation. And what not, you know? I was just so there was so much anger bottled up in me, you know. But I learned how to deal with that anger. And I said to myself, "I'm at the point. God has elevated me now to be in charge of everyone. I should not rub it in God's face or even in my father's face. No, I should just make the best out of it." And so here we are. I think my dad, my dad is just ah, he's an alright guy. That's why I get his um, very free. Beautiful nature from like he's just an all rounder like you know he still speaks to all of my friends all my Helen Paul is his best friend Helen Paul Ruki Sanda Linda KG my dad will call them and have ended conversations with them I think it made me think that one of them is the person that I am trying to marry or maybe he's basically turning them for me I don't know but I think he's he's liberal minded he never sat me down to say you know what. You're staining the family name. You need to stop this entire. That's exactly. Outbreak. That was that. That was the next. That was the next oh, yeah. question. How do you think he deals with comments? Because you know his friends will talk yeah. to him, right? How do you think he deals yeah. with it? Family ah, member. He's the Yoruba one now. He's the Nigerian now. He would even go to the market and buy me safety pins when you. Where does he? Like, hey. Safety pins. Find me what what and what things that I like to adorn my ensembles with. Wow. So I think I will, that's why I give him all the kudos in the world because he was very. Not necessarily supportive, like he didn't. He wasn't vocally supportive, but he was, you know, mentally supportive, and you know, his presence in a way. He didn't make me feel I would have to cower in fear and stop what I'm doing. No, he didn't make me feel like that. He just, just said, you know what, this child is special. Let's celebrate the special beauty, beautiful characteristics of this child, and that's what I would do. And that's why I think a lot of we're getting to that time where parents are beginning to recognize, appreciate, and acknowledge the unique differences in their kids, and they're allowing them somehow, somewhat, express it to a certain magnitude. Maybe not in totality as we like, but to a certain degree. Uh uh-uh. uh. And today, Red MC, my, Red MC said, Me, I will stop telling you. <laughs> happy 40th to Makosi. She just clocked 40, I think, a few days ago. Makosi is a cancer survivor, one of the most amazing Africans alive. And she was one African that did the African continent proud on the Big Brother UK show. Mm. She was like the first African on the Big Brother, like the international franchise. When Makosi went on the show, guess what? They didn't give her clothes. Makosi was walking around naked. She said, you know what? You want us You want us to go with the narrative that Africans don't have clothes. I will show you people say with a phrase. I want to give her clothes to <laughs> Red MC says, I, "Me, I won't stop saying I love you." Red MC. That is awesome. <laughs> is pretty and glorious. And Shola, you are ageless, timeless, flawless, and stainless. And then my favorite song of Red MC. If you're ready to party and you wanna get naughty. Come and shake it like that. I'm sorry, I can't sing to save my life. Mama, I'm happy, you know, I spoke the song. And then, of course, Joya. We were grooving to Joya. I was out a few nights ago. Yes, yes. And we're grooving to Joya. Eh, Joya. Ah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know what? Yeah. You know what? You know what? You have failed to say. You have failed to yeah. say that joy, joy keeps you going. Well, you know, you'll you say you have to save the best for last. Joy, happiness, peace of mind, inner peace. It, it, it was a rough road to get there, but I had to. And then it needed to constantly, at the point I thought I had to validate myself every mm. single time. So, uh, validation from other external, people. External, people. external validation. Yes, yeah. but I always thought external validation was, was going to be my driving force. How why don't they like me? What did I do wrong? 
Who am I not being accepted this way? But guess what? I don't give a hoot right now. Pack. The only validation I need is validation from within. And with that, I'm fine. And that's why I said, you are not for everybody else, and that's fine. You cannot be for everybody, and that's okay. Pam. Wow. Dearly, well, thank you so much for. I have a million and one questions, so much, but if you guys have wow. questions for Dearly, we're just going to take two. Just two. Okay. Just two. two questions. Just two questions, and that's it, man. I'm telling you, whatever you, wherever you find yourself, joy will keep you. Joy is your strength, it keeps amen. you going. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 <laughs> okay, so. To all of the people that sent me, okay, oh my goodness, I have to read this. This is quite lengthy. Somebody says, having the relay is like one million like friends. Having, um, one, one million, million friends, friends in one. one. The relay will sell your market more than you can sell it. Oh, true? Yes. And then yes. Um, the most supportive friend anyone could ask for, love you and apology. Ah, uh ah, -uh. Santiago, you are here. <laughs> Santiago. Red MC says, how have you been? Hey, hey, I must not miss Red MC, so how have you been able to stay so loving regardless? Mm. <laughs> I have too much love to give. We keep sharing all the love in the world. Love is, I mean, love would cost us absolutely nothing. Mm. Always try and lend a helping hand as much as you can. I like to be quite instrumental to people's success stories because I believe in paying it forward. It's like one of the hardest things to do because we're in an industry where everybody's for themselves. Nobody wants to help the next person. They feel that yeah. I help you, they're taking my job. Nah, just do what you can and leave the world a better place. Ah, mm. may I preach love? Let's be preaching as a yeah, preacher of love. Yeah, I preach of love. I preach of love. <laughs> the love of the Lord. Yeah, and um, like I said, I have too much love to give. I think that I'm some sort of sacrificial lamb because the love I give, it never really comes back. But it's mm. fine. It's fine. I always just keep giving it. We'll keep giving all the love in the world. Whether it comes back. And, you know, I've learned not to be too expectant mm. from people. I just do because I want to. I give because I want to. I extend a helping hand because I simply want to. I do what I want to do graciously without expecting anything in return. And, like, somebody was talking about, oh, that you've helped so many people in the industry and you've never really come out to say, I don't need to. That is not the validation I need. Well, of course, people come and say thank you. Whether they do or they not, I'm not expecting that. I just do it and move. Yeah. Pay forward. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. What are your plans for the future? Oh, so much. You see, with all of these stories I've shared, I've been saying it for the past four or five years that I'm going to document everything and chronicle all my experiences in a book. And yes, there is some, a, a book that would spotlight my travails, my ups, my downs, and, you know, even unveil the mystery behind the enigmatic Fugerele. Yes. And I think for somebody who solidly stood alone with no form of support system, with no mentor, with nobody to really run to, with no financial support, backbone whatsoever, and I'm standing strong today. I think it's a story I'm a story waiting to be told. There you go. There you go. <laughs> and then, of course, more TV. As much what I love to do, the things I love to do. And I've noticed that, I mean, I always tell people the party don't start today, really works in. Me, I create awareness wherever I go. And that awareness is an awareness with the purpose. I wrote it. I was just looking for like a line that had purpose in it. Yeah, I saw I it. I was that. like, nice. Yeah. 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 We create awareness wherever we go and awareness with purpose. Yeah. Mm, purpose. Why, why, is it, is mm, why is it that a lot of people forget about purpose when they're doing? They just, they, in as much as we're supposed to be in the moment, they, they get in the moment and forget the long term. Why are we doing what we're doing now? You know? we're, swayed, we're swayed by too many things happening on the social media stratosphere. We're swayed by the colorful pictures that we see on people's Instagram. We're swayed by numbers. We're swayed by followers. We're swayed by comments. We're swayed by visuals. That there really is no content anymore. And mm. I always say this, that content is what mobilizes an audience. Well, if you're looking at 
this is an era where facts is no longer fact. Fake is always real. Disruption is constant. Mm. So how do you keep your head up above all of that and stay true to yourself? You have to find your true calling. Find it, or else somebody else will find it for you. You have to constantly sell your story, or the market will or sell project project a, a story. Or they project a different narrative of your story. Remember, I said we can all be mad together. The acronym for mad making a difference. Making a difference. Make, make difference. No. Make it all, make it all. Wow. And then as Africans, we all got swag. SWH is something we Africans got. Those are my favorite mm. acronyms that I point to myself. Intellectually stamped, sign sealed and deliver, stamp of approval. They really 2020. <laughs> Dearly, thank you so much. Do you have anything yeah, else you yeah, want yeah, people to? Let me pass out the plenty of people around me now and charge okay. this phone. Well, Buki, thank you so much to start with. It's a great thing you're doing. It's an empowering, emancipating initiative to have anyone on Buki's place to come share their stories and then take it from a different angle. It's usually about, oh, uh, you know, but you have taken it, you have, you've taken it, created a beautiful template. A template that, I mean, people would want to learn from, tap from, and just, you know, hold to their hearts and say, you know what, I can work on this and I can make it happen. To anybody out there, to every single person that joined this live, I say thank you so much. I know I want to apologize because, again, my account, my Instagram account has been shadow banned for over a year mm -hmm. where all thanks to the fans from the Big Brother should have reported the living daylight out of my account. So, <laughs> everyone who managed to get on i say thank you so much for joining and i hope you're able to pick one or two Pearls get us erica stuff. get us yes. erica get us erica don't worry about that he said, uh, uh, he said don't be erica me oh my one is cbm i worry <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Dele, thank you so much for taking I time out you. i know you're not even home love you so much god bless you love with you all your friend. endeavors and don't yes. what you said something i don't want you to say that again you said okay. i know i'm not a role model don't yes. don't don't we call people it's the outside force that calls people a role model that's why when i see all this new generation that they say oh i want to be a role model i want to be nah. people call you a role model and a role model is anything that I want. It doesn't have to be the totality of you. It could just be that I'm picking this courage. I'm picking this way you respond. Because you don't even respond to haters. I've seen them compare you to Bob Risky. I've seen them do a lot. I don't see you sitting down and saying your father, your mother, all of Sometimes, yes, no. maybe you clap back. But, you know, yeah. So... You could you could be a role model in any way, and you have been. You're breaking limits, you're pushing limits, you're breaking bounds, and that's what it's about. So we love you very much, Derele. And you know, you and I have been rocking since the 60s, and we yes, we're gonna you know, keep rocking. We're gonna keep rocking, oh Morile, Morile, yeah. I'm Morile I'm retired. I'm retired, I'm retired. Ah, to retire. I love you so much, Daryl. God bless you. you. And yes, let me know when you're coming to Yankee. Oh, let's let's ah, let's highlight it. Don't worry about that. So we are coming very soon, and I shall let you know straight up. I will okay. send you. All right. Answer the area. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Be Help me say goodbye. I love you to be. This ministry can never run down. This ministry can never depreciate. And can mm -hmm. I say, you are a shining armor. You stand the deep back. In short, you are an unstoppable fireball mm -hmm. of energy and a force of nature. You are a national treasure and a monument to mankind. Signing ah. out. As far as you say, well done, man. Well done. Well done, man. <laughs> love you so much.